Our scripture reading there in Psalms 145, verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. Do you believe that? Even when it's not in your ways, but they're righteous in all of his ways. Gracious in all his works. Gracious in all of his works. Keep that in mind. Are there works in scripture that sometimes God allows certain things to happen? But yet here David reminds us they're gracious in his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He also will hear the, their cry and save them. This is why I was saying during the garden of prayer, even if you don't feel that you deserve to be heard from God, which we don't, but praise the Lord, God does hear us and doesn't turn away from us. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you very much for the privilege and the duty of prayer. And I ask that you be with us as we open your word. Please remove any demonic angel here or any evil influence. And may your Holy Spirit fill our minds. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. This morning we're going to go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. We're going to see here, I believe that Pastor Powell has began sermons on prayer, and Pastor Kilgore also talked about prayer, the importance of prayer, and, and there is a prayer here in, in Acts chapter 12 that I want us to look at. It's Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Okay, this is the James that was part of that trio that Jesus would always invite. Whenever Jesus, you know, he, he raised a young girl or he went to pray alone, he always took with him, or in the Mount of Transfiguration, you, you, you remember who he always took? Peter, James, and John. And here Herod knocks out James. He takes him. He kills James by the sword. Now this isn't the Herod the Great that we're talking about. This is, this is Herod Agrippa I, which was the grandson of Herod the Great. And most Herods, when you read in the Bible, um, enjoy killing. They, they, they enjoy killing. You, who was the one who made the order to kill all the children in Bethlehem? It was Herod. Uh, the, the, who killed John the Baptist? It was Herod who killed Jesus. So, so, so Herods enjoyed killing people. And so here, they were in charge also Caesars had, had appointed Herods to be in charge of Palestine, of the, of the Palestine area, and their main job was to keep the peace. Make sure that the Jews are happy and in keeping the peace. And they kept the peace, but they kept the peace with an iron fist. So if the Jews weren't happy, they would take care of it. So here, Herod has James killed by the sword. And notice, notice verse 3. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize who? Peter. Peter also. Why didn't he choose somebody else? Because he knows that these three, Peter, James, and John, were, were the church's leaders. And he's thinking, if I can wipe out the leaders, the main leaders, maybe it will even please more the Jews. But Peter wasn't arrested here for preaching, right? There are, there are other places in Scripture that Peter was arrested for what? For preaching, and they told him not to preach, and he got put into jail. But here, he was only arrested. Why? Was he preaching or doing anything wrong? 
Nope. He was only arrested because Herod realized, hey, the Jews like that I killed James. Well, let me get the next one. Bring Peter in. And they arrested Peter and they brought him in. But notice how the verse continues. There in verse 3. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded first to, to seize Peter also. Now it was during the day of unleavened bread, also known as Passover. And verse 4 says, So when he had apprehended him, who is a him? Who did he apprehend? Peter. He put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after what? Why not kill him there and then? Why did he have to wait after Passover? Because he wanted to please the Jews and keeping in mind the Jews wanted Peter dead also. But it, what did the Jews say? No, 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 no. This is a feast day. This is Passover. This is when we remember when, when we left Israel and how God delivered us. And we praise the Lord for that deliverance. This is a high uh, festival. We must celebrate and thank the Lord for that. And give our hearts and remembering the Passover of that unleavened bread, which, re which represents the Messiah. And after we have consecrated, then we can kill Peter. Is there, is there something wrong with that picture? Hello? Yes. We're, you see, they said, this is Passover. We're not going to do anything at Passover. It's like saying, this is the Sabbath. We're not going to do anything. Wait for the sun to go down, then we'll go kill Peter. <laughs> they were focused on one thing and ignoring the whole personality and character of God and how they represent God as well. And there's some Christians like that too. They focus on one thing, right? The, the, the Sabbath is sacred to them. They, don't, they keep the Sabbath. They honor the Sabbath. But during the rest of the week, nobody knows that they're a Christian. They have a different um, character or, or actions. My personal favorite of those that like to focus on one thing. Now, should, should Christians boast? Should Christians boast? And look, you know, both, both, you know, be proud and, and uh, look down at, at others. No. But there are some who boast uh, because, because they, and I know I'm going to step on toes here, and that's intentional. <laughs> because there is a, a message, friends. There is a message. These people were focused, no, wait till after Passover. Passover is sacred to us. There are Christians who boast because of their vegetarianism or their veganism. There is, I, am, I am not downplaying vegetarianism or veganism. Absolutely not. There is a place for it in the Christian life. Absolutely. But there are some that boast and, and they, if, if, they, if, if they look at somebody else maybe getting a, some butter on a bread and you eat butter... Don't you know, and there's a lecture that we already know, the harmful, the dairy products, but there's some that boast. But, but friends, if you suffer from high cholesterol, from high blood pressure, from diabetes, and you are out of shape, you have nothing to boast about your vegetarianism. Amen. Because, because the health message it's not, it's not Linkets or, or Big Franks. The health message is a healthy body with no diseases. That's the health message. So, 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 so boasting, you know, focusing on one thing and ignoring the rest, which includes exercise, sleep, rest, water, and, and plenty of things as well. Just like how these Jews, they focused, oh, Passover, we can't touch Passover. After that, then we'll break the rest of the commandments and kill Peter. So what do they do? There in verse 5. Notice Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but what kind of prayer? Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. 
Notice not just prayer, constant prayer. Constant prayer. Constant prayer was offered to him by the church. A church that does not believe in prayer is a church that's, that's going to die. Constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. They didn't try to arrange maybe with lawyers on how to get Peter out of jail. They could have. They, they didn't try to break him out to themselves. No, the church got on their knees and prayed for Peter's deliverance. They, the church got on their knees and pre, prayed for Peter, Peter's deliverance. This is why, friends, prayer is so important and prayer meeting is very important. As we're going to see here in the rest of this story, individual prayers are powerful, absolutely. But collective prayers, I don't know what it is, are more powerful. Are just more powerful. And so here we see that the church is praying for him. Notice, notice now verse, verse 6. Notice now verse 6. So, I'm sorry. And Herod was about to bring him out. That night, Peter slept. That night, Peter was sleeping. I'm sorry. Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Do you find it odd or interesting that he was even sleeping to begin with, knowing that the next day he would be executed? What was he sleeping for? Was he resting his energy? He wasn't doing anything the next day, but getting, but was going to get killed. Why was he sleeping? You see, when you believe, when you really believe in the resurrection, death is not a scary thing. You know that you're going to be waking up when Jesus comes. As the hymn says, it is well with my soul. And Peter left his life completely in God's hands. It was nighttime. I'm sure he had his prayer and went to sleep. He was sleeping the peaceful sleep of perfect trust. Of perfect trust, friends. Do you ever, do you sleep like that during your hard trials or problems, financial problems, marriage problems, children problems? Do you sleep that type of sleep? You see, what does it take for someone to sleep like that? It takes total trust in God. Total surrender to God's will. Total surrender to God's will. Notice verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone, shone in the prison. Now you would have th thought that the light woke up Peter. I don't know how many of you are those that you have to sleep in complete darkness. I mean complete, complete darkness. I know my wife is like that. Even if, even if I'm looking at something on my phone, on the bed, and she says, turn that off, the light bothers me. It's just, and, I, and you can dim it, right? You can still dim it. And, and sometimes, I don't know how she does it, but even puts the covers over her eyes. She in complete darkness. A little light wakes her up. And here, this ain't glorious angel doesn't wake up Peter. So what does the angel do? The angel strikes him. <laughs> wake up. And not only strikes him on the side and raises him up. He even picks him up. He's not just, oh, I'm awake, you know, and, and gets up. No, he's probably waking up, and, and the angel picks him up. How many of you have children that do not get up right away? <laughs> I have three children, and one of them is like that. You know, the others, you can go and turn on the light. Okay, time to wake up. Let, let's go. Okay, they get up, and come in down from the bunk bed, or, the other ones, you can turn on the light, you can take out the cover, and they're still sound asleep. And then you have to go and you tug them, you know? You know, you go and you pop their, their toes on their feet. Don't do that, but you got to shake them. They just don't wake up. Here, Peter, the angel had to strike Peter, raise him up, and said what? Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And then there, it begins to describe on how the angel took him 
from one set of guards to the other set of guards, opened the gate, the other set of guards, and kept on going. You know how many guards there were guarding Peter that were chained to Peter and to them, to the guards? There were 16 guards. I know that because actually the apostle says so there in your meditation. 16 guards missed the angel and Peter. Is there, is there power in prayer? So he escapes and he ends up half asleep in the middle of the street by himself. Once the angel took him out, the angel says, I'm done here and is gone. And Peter is left alone in the street, still half awake and half asleep. You can see that there in verse 11, where it says, And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectations of the Jewish people. Don't miss that word, delivered. Now I know that his angel has delivered me. And so then in verse 12 it says, so when, he came, so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary. He quickly got out of the street. Okay? He was afraid probably that somebody could have seen him and said, hey, what's he doing out? So he goes and, and looks for a refuge goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together doing what? Pray. Praying. And what were they praying for? Peter. For Peter. And Peter was at the front door. Peter was there at the front door. Now notice verse 13 through 16. This is the main point of this morning's message. As Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhonda came, Rhoda, I'm sorry, Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she be, be, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate. She was so excited, she forgot to open the door. But ran in and announced that Peter stood at the gate. But they, who are the they? These are the saints, all right? The church, the holy people of God. What they tell her? You're crazy. We're praying. Don't interrupt. You're crazy. Yet she kept on insisting. Praise the Lord that she did. She kept on insisting that it was so. So they said, oh, it is an angel. But still the door isn't open. Okay, while she's over there talking and insisting and insisting, what is Peter doing? I don't think he just knocked one time and then just waited. You know, sometimes, sometimes I don't catch some of you when, when I go visit. I ring the doorbell once and say, oh, well, their car is here. Well, maybe they're asleep. No, well, let me just try it one, one, one more time. You know, and some, you don't know from, 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 from the outside because sometimes some, some doorbells don't work, you know, and you gotta knock. But here, Peter, you think he just knocked once or twice? He was knocking and knocking, yet there it says, now Peter, verse 16, continued knocking. He continued knocking. I'm sure he's thinking, I can get out of prison, but I can't come into your house. <laughs> <laughs> and when they opened the door and saw him, they were what? <laughs> what? Astonished. Astonished. And why? Why were they astonished? What were they doing? They were praying for Peter and Peter's deliverance. And then they were astonished. Friends, here's a simple question. Have you ever prayed for something? And when God answered your prayers, you were surprised. Has that ever happened to anyone? It's happened to me. You've been praying for something and then God answers that prayer and you're surprised. Why are we surprised when that happens? Why were they astonished? When we came to Keene from South Texas, it was in August of 2006, we came to Keene, Texas, and I was beginning my studies there in Southwestern. 
we went through some hard financial times. I came with, with, with savings that I had saved, that we had saved, and thinking it would be enough. Thinking it would be enough. But with Arlene, a year and a half, I think, and Danny, six months old, you know how it is when you have two babies and a toddler, or and a, two toddlers, how the money just flies through your fingers with diapers, with formula, with visiting the, the doctor. And the money we had saved was gone. And we tried to, of course, be wise with our money and try to um, take care of the consumption of water. If you live in King, you know that you get robbed when you pay the water bill. <laughs> and, 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 you know, try to hurry up. And, and uh, Arlene was potty trained by the time she was two. And so we had one child less to pay for, for diapers. But yet, there came a time where our bank account was actually not just zero, in the negatives. In the negatives. And the, the, month, the, the rent was coming up very soon. And most places give you five days of grace. You know, by the fifth, it needs to be paid. And, uh, and that day was coming very quickly, if not the next day. And we had nothing to give for it. You know, have you ever been in such a financial crisis that you look around the house, what can we return? Am I the only one who goes through these things? I don't think so. You know, you, you, you start looking and, and maybe, oh, that toy, well, they don't need it right now. You, just got, you, you still got the receipt. Or you start looking for stuff to try to at least make ends a little bit. But even if it would have returned a couple of things, it would have never fulfilled the rent. And we, we didn't, our parents, our parents didn't, didn't know of our financial uh, crisis, you know, it's, I've always considered that our problems are our problems. And that i rather appeal to God first. And, uh, and then maybe the family. So, this brought, this of course wasn't just a one-time occasion. Several times we were in these needs, but in this particular time, this particular time, Silly and I fought very, um, very long, and con and con and and reconsidering. We need we need we need to go back. What are we doing here? You have a job back in Harlingen, and we don't need to be suffering like this with two little ones. And uh, and I really went to the Lord in prayer that night. I remember I, I didn't have a cell phone yet, but I took off my watch. We used to live down on 3rd Street there in Keene. I walked to the university. It was late. I kept on walking to the, the little pond is, and I kept on. There used to be a little bridge there that you can cross. I'm still waiting for them to rebuild that. And, and then, if, I don't know if you've noticed, in the back of that, there's a big telescope. It's inside, it's inside a big, uh, there's a fence around it. It's a little con container way back there. I went and prayed and knelt and put my face on the ground and prayed to God and pleaded with God. I don't know how long it was. I wasn't keeping time, but I took my time in prayer to God, begging Him. There were even times where I prayed and said, Lord, if we need to turn back, then whisper it to my ear. Tell me something. And so I came back home to find that Celie and the kids were already asleep. I don't know what time it, it was, but it was late. And I tried to go to sleep, but couldn't. The next day, I was still perplexed because that was it. They had already given us a notice, you know, hey, it's already been several days. And they're going to start charging, you know, the, the late fees. And by a miracle of God, in the mail, was a check for the exact amount of rent that we needed, not by my mom, not by her mom, but by a friend of my mother-in-law's that live in California. And I don't even know how they knew our address because we had never given it to them. 
but they somehow got a hold of it and in a note it says God bless you hope this little bit helps Amen. friends I'm not a crier but I couldn't help myself on how God you know when my first question was Lord who am I that you should even do this to us and I praise the Lord And I knelt down, my face literally on the ground, and said, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Yes. That didn't only happen once, that happened at least several times. Several times. In another occasion, we got an envelope where we used to uh, be members of the Bronzeville Spanish Church, and the pastor of that church, again, sent us a donation. Here is from the church board. Hope this helps. And again, that was the exact amount, again, that we needed in that case was for the water bill exact amount and and you see you have to think friends I didn't pray for this I didn't pray for a check I just prayed for God to help but God knew days in advance that I would pray and he impressed days before for somebody to do something in the other occasion, he impressed the pastor to take it to the board and to vote in the board, hey, should we send a little help to Harley and Salid? And the board said yes, obviously. And then talk to the treasurer, write the check and send it. Way before I had even thinking about needing that, God is acting before I am asking, friends. Friends, when we pray, we do not just talk in the air. We're talking to God. We're talking to the God who told Moses, go into Egypt and I will be with you. The same God who gave Daniel the dream. The same God who calmed the storms just with his voice. Prayer is more than just a nice thing, friends. Prayer, as Ty Gibson would say, is an act of war. War against who? Against the devil. That's why Ephesians 6 verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, no, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, this, the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. The world has its weapons, friends, but the church has its weapon, and that's prayer. And that's prayer. Now the story doesn't end here. From verses 20 through verse 24, we see that what happens to Herod. Herod, just paraphrasing here, does gives a speech and he wears beautiful garments that when the sun reflects, it, sh it makes him look shiny. And people are saying in verse 22 and the people kept shouting the voice of God and not of man and that that pleased Herod but that people were saying oh this is the voice of God and not of a man notice verse 23 and immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died this story right here of Herod's death can be found in the writings of Josephus actually it's the writings of Josephus, Antiquities, uh, Ju Judaica, in chapter 8, paragraph 3. Right? Josephus records of this story of how Herod Agrippa I died from a strong stomach pain. But praise the Lord, look at verse 24. But the word of God grew and what? And multiplied. This story, this chapter opens with Herod killing James, preparing to kill Peter, and Herod is triumphing, having the victory. It begins like that. But how does it end? With Herod dead, with Peter free, and with the word of God having victory and triumphing. And it was all attributed to what? What was the church doing? Praying. Praying. It was all attributed to prayer. There is power in prayer, friends. There is power in prayer. A true story is, was told to me 
This is a true story and it was told to me of a mother. Of a mother who struggled after her divorce with her, with her husband. And the struggle really was for the children. You know, she, she wanted to keep custody of the kids and he wanted to keep custody of the kids and she did not believe in, in sharing custody of the children. And she was in that struggle. You see, her, her, her ex-husband, her husband that she had divorced, had joined a lifestyle that was more than worldly. It, it, it was a lifestyle of, of motorcycle gangs, a lifestyle of living in the street, a lifestyle of uh, sexual immorality, and she knew that that, that that was not a place for, two, for her two kids to be around that. And so she went, she left the, in her despair to protect her children, she fled the country. She left the United States and went to our neighboring country south, which is what? Mexico. And in Mexico, she went to visit somebody who I know who is my grandfather. And she goes to him and says, you know, and she explains the, the situation. I am running from my husband. He wants to take the kids. And she appealed, can we stay here for a little bit? And she, he said, sure, you can stay here. Now, for those who don't know much about my grandfather, he was a big man, strong man. Nothing intimidated him. Whenever I see Junior's hands, they remind me of my grandfather. Big, fat fingers. <laughs> you know, whenever my mother would say, when your grandpa would hit us with his hand, that would leave a mark for days. I mean, it was big bear's claw. Big, wide shoulders, strong, you know. So even, even as grandkids, and my grandfather only had grandsons except for one granddaughter, and that was my sister. And so even among all of the grandsons, you know, he was always rough with us, with the boys. And, uh, and very, very strong. But at this time, at this time, when she came to him, he was weak, just had surgery, and was lying down in home, recovering and healing, and his, the, 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 the place where they had uh, done, the, done the operation and the, and the incisions was infected, and they were treating the infection, so he was in bed, could not get up. Normally, normally, my grandfather, I know, would have said, bring him on. But in this situation, he was flat on his bed, could not do anything, could not get up to walk, could not get up for any reason, just recovering and healing from his operation. And she had received threats. She had received threats from her ex-husband. Somehow he found out where they were. And he says, we're going to go and we're going to get the kids. We're going over to get the kids. And although some people would try to counsel her and say, you know what, we can get attorneys to help you in this process. And he says, but there's no time. He is coming already. He is on his way. He is traveling here. He could be here the next, this next morning. And so my grandfather did the only thing that he knew to do. And that was pray. He prayed to God. He prayed and pleaded with God. And he prayed earnestly and fervently for God's protection and deliverance for this mother and her children from these evil men. What kind of man? Evil man. He couldn't get up. He couldn't do anything. So he prayed earnestly that God protect and deliver this mother. The next morning, the next morning, as he spent most of the night praying and reading scripture and praying, the next morning a member comes rushing to the house and knocking really hard and even coming in with the news to announce to my grandfather and the mother that the men who were coming on the way died in a car accident yesterday. You see, the day before on their way, the report 
says that the driver fell asleep while on the highway and the car just swerved over to the oncoming traffic, ran right into an 18-wheeler. Instantly, instantly died. And when my grandfather heard this, and the mother was, was there and she was surprised and didn't know, he just takes a big gasp and says, the Lord has delivered you from the evil that was to come. Friends, prayer is not just a nice little thing we say to others. I'll pray for you. I'll keep it in my prayer. Prayer, when I, when I remember of this story, is an act of war. We're not fighting flesh and blood, as the Bible says, but we're fighting the devil and his angels. And the only way to fight against them is to pray and have angels, God's angels, fight for us. Amen. God's angels fight for us. Prayer is an act of war. War against Satan. And you will only win your battles on your knees. You will only win your battles on your knees. The world has their, their, their weapons. Whatever weapons they want. But the church has prayer. The church has its weapon. And I hope that you, in your home, have prayer in your home. This is the weapon that Christians have. And today, today's appeal is different. Today's appeal comes to you in the insert, in your bulletin. And so I'm going to ask if the, if the deacons can help me. You should have a paper that says, My Commitment. If you do not have one, raise your hand. Okay, the deacons are on their way. I want every single person to have this paper. Prayer is an act of war, friends. Here, if you read the story in Acts, those guards died because they couldn't keep Peter. Raise your hands if you don't have one and the deacons will come and get one there. And there are some in the balcony as well, so we need another deacon up there as well. Prayer is an act of war. And God, friends, if God is before us, who can be against us? Friends, there are many stories in Scripture where you see that God intervenes and fights. How do you think the walls of Jericho fell down? It wasn't by Joshua. It was by the prayers of Joshua and God's angels intervening. You think that David prayed when he went to face Goliath? Of course he did. The Bible said that David prayed three times a day. It was the prayer of David and the angel that guided that stone to take down the enemy's giant. Prayer is an act of war. Keep raising your hands if you don't have one. I want every one of us to have one. There is a bag in the back as well if you don't have a pen. If you, don't, if, if you don't ask your neighbor if you can borrow a pen or pencil. But there, my commitment, it begins with quoting 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people pray. Notice that. If. It's kind of implying you don't pray. If you did, it'd be different. If my people pray who are called by my name will humble themselves. Notice that and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Friends, we didn't cover it today, but we will. But there are conditions for God answering prayers. Amen. God is not the Santa Claus in heaven that gives you a present whether you're good or bad. But here, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. And the first question is, I believe that God is bigger than my circumstances and I choose to trust Him no matter what. If you do, check that. You believe that God is bigger than your circumstances and you choose to trust Him no matter what. When Acts 12 starts, the, the church is faced with real problems. 
with real problems. James is already dead, and they're about to kill Peter. You think that would shake the church? Yes. They're faced with a real problem, but God changes those circumstances. And I know that there are people in this very room, in this very balcony, in the fellowship hall, wherever you can hear the sound of my voice, I know that there are people who are facing difficult circumstances of various kinds. Your family may be falling apart. You may be losing your job. Your health may be going. But you believe that God is bigger than your circumstances and you choose to trust him no matter what. Check that if you do. I need special prayer. Check that if you need special prayer. I need to pray more and I choose to pray more. Check that. I need to pray more and I choose to pray more. I, check, I, I need to do that. I check that. I choose not to fear the Herods in my life. Peter was sleeping calmly, even in prison while chained up. He did not fear the Herod because his, 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 his life was in the hands of Jesus. James did not fear Herod. And he gave his life. And his life was in the hand of Jesus. God allowed James to die. And James was comfortable with that. And Peter, if he would have died, he would have been comfortable with that. Do you remember the three Hebrew, the, the three Hebrew boys as, as Nebuchadnezzar say, we're going to throw you in the fire if you don't bow down and worship. They say, our God can deliver us. But if he doesn't, we're willing to go. I choose not to fear the Herods in my life. Check that if you choose not to. And number, and number five, if you are not a member of this church and you would like to be, check that as well. Please print your name there. Print your name as, as Pastor Austin and myself. We take these and we pray over them. We pray for you as well. Put a contact number or an email, a way that we can reach you, friends. At the end of today's service, as we sing our closing hymn, at the end, I will have Danny holding a basket out there in the foyer, and you just drop it in the basket. You can fold it up if you want. It does not matter. Just drop it in the basket. Friends, do you believe in prayer? I hope you do, friends. It is the weapon for us. And I'm going, I'm going to read our closing hymn before we pray. There is a quiet place, far from the rapid pace, where God can soothe my troubled mind. Sheltered by trees and flowers, there, there in my quiet hour with Him, my cares are left behind. Whether a garden small or on a mountain tall, new strength and courage there I find. Then, from this quiet place, I go prepared to face a new day with love for all mankind. Friends, I just appeal to you to fill out this commitment. And I appeal to you, if, no, I appeal to you to pray more. I know you already pray. I know you do. I appeal to you to seek the Lord more in prayer. And He is the only way, and through prayer is the only way, that you will win any battle. Any battle. You're having trouble at work, you're having problems in your marriage, problems with your children, or with family members, take it to the Lord in prayer. And you will see God at work. You will see God at work. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you very much because there is power in prayer. Thank you very much because you hear our prayers. And so God in heaven, I thank you very much as we read earlier that a fervent, humbled prayer 
makes the devil tremble. But Lord, help us to humble ourselves, to walk in your ways, to seek your face, and that your will be done in our lives. You know our prayers, you know our prayer requests. I lift them up again to you. You know those that came during the garner prayers and those that stood there, you know every prayer that was lifted up to you this morning. And I just ask you again, O oh Lord, that you take each prayer and comfort each heart, fill them with your Holy Spirit, but take each prayer and answer it according to your divine will. And give us the understanding and assurance of that. Thank you, Father, because you fight our battles for us. But we need to come to you in prayer for that. Bless your church here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.